Now I just want to cover a few more properties of the definite integral. This first one we've already seen. If the function is positive, then the integral is positive. So a nice visual for this is if the function is positive, the integral is going to represent the area between the curve and the x-axis. So the area will be positive. If the function was negative, then the function would sit below the axes and the integral will represent negative the area, or the signed area of the region between the curve and the axes. Okay, so what about if you have one function sitting above another one on the entire interval that you're integrating over? What can you say about their integrals? Well, if f is bigger than g, then the integral of f is bigger than the integral of g. And here's a a picture which represents a situation where both f and g are positive. You can have similar pictures where um, they could be negative. But the idea here is that the function f should have a bigger area than the area under the function of g. Now what about this last property? Well here, if our function f is trapped between two values, little m and big M, so little m's a lower bound on the function, big M's an upper bound on the function, and that those bounds hold on the entire interval, then we can say that the function, the integral of the function, is trapped between these two values. Now this is just coming from this picture. So here, little m, maybe it's this point down here. So if I take the rectangle of height little m, the area of this rectangle is this value here. But the area under the curve is bigger than the area of that rectangle. So the integral better be bigger than m times b minus a. Now what about the other inequality? Well, if I take m to be the maximum and draw a horizontal line, then by similar reasoning, this big rectangle of height m and base b minus a has to enclose the area of the region under the curve. And so the area of the big rectangle has to be bigger than the integral. Now these pictures are all centered around the case where the function is positive, but these results also hold, you know, in, in parts b and c, they hold where the function is negative and these values of m and n could be negative as well. Just as long as the inequalities are in those right directions, then the inequalities all hold. So let's look at a really quick example of uh, an application of this property. So here we're interested in coming up with an upper and lower bound on the value of this integral. So from 1 to 2, the thing to keep in mind here is that f is a decreasing function on the interval 1 to 2. The graph is drawn here and you can see it's decreasing, but you could also check uh, that the derivative is negative. Check that the derivative of the function is negative and you'll see that it's decreasing on that interval. So since it's decreasing, we know that the function is smaller than the value at 1 and bigger than its value at 2. It's bigger than that value on the entire interval. The function values are always bigger than that one and always smaller than this value here. So this is e to the negative 1 and that is e to the negative 4. So this is essentially our little m and this is our big M in the context of those properties we just studied. So this means that the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the negative x squared dx is smaller than e to the negative 1 times the length of the interval, 2 minus 1, and bigger than, um, I should say, maybe say equal to because they're equal at the endpoints, um, is bigger than e to the negative 4 times 2 minus 1. And 2 minus 1 is 1 in each of these cases. So those are both 1. And that has therefore established the result that we wanted. We've got a bounds on the, on the integrals themselves. Okay, So just a quick application of how you could apply those results from before. 
In this last example, we just want to show how those properties of the integrals can apply to more theoretical questions. So in this example, we have that f is a continuous function on the interval a, b, and we want to show that the absolute value of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value function. So uh, maybe just a, a, a quick look at why this should seem intuitively true based on a picture. So suppose our function f looks something like this. And there's our interval a to b. Now what does the integral of f of x dx mean? Well, it's the signed area. It's the area of all the stuff above minus the area of the stuff below. So this is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. It's that signed area. On the other hand, this other side is saying integrate the absolute value function. So what does the absolute value function of f look like? Well, it takes, it leaves f alone if f is positive, but wherever f is negative, it flips it above the axis and makes it positive. So it looks like this. And there's a to b. And now what is the integral from a to b of the absolute value of f of x dx? mean? Well, it's asking for the area of this region. And at this point, it should seem clear that the second integral here should be bigger than the first one, because the second integral is adding all of these areas up, whereas the first one is taking the area of the two things above and subtracting off the area of the bottom. So it should seem clear from the picture that the integral of the absolute value of f is bigger than the absolute value of the integral. We can prove this. Uh, I mean, the diagram is suggestive that this is true. We can prove this using those properties of the integrals. And so let's go ahead and do that. We'll see how such a proof can, can be done. So we're going to start with f of x. And we'll just notice that it's trapped between the absolute value of f of x. It's always smaller than its absolute value, smaller than or equal to and it's always bigger than or equal to negative the absolute value of f of x. Because if f is positive, it's just equal to f itself, which would be the same thing as absolute value of f of x. But the worst case scenario is f is a negative value, in which case it doesn't, it, it's equal to negative the absolute value of f of x. So it's always trapped between these two values. Now, what can we do? Well, at this stage, we've got three functions and the inequalities between them, and these hold on the entire interval a to b. So that previous property said that if we know f is bigger than g on the interval, then the integral of f is bigger than the integral of g. In other words, the integrals preserve the inequality. So I can integrate through everything here. a to b, f of x dx is less than or equal to the integral from a to b, absolute value of f of x dx, and the integral of minus, absolute value of f of x dx from a to b. So this is trapped between these integrals. One thing I can note here is that this negative in front of the absolute value of f of x, I can move it outside. Now I'm just going to say, well, this is just some number. And it just happens to be the same number over here. And well, I'm just going to call it, just for sake of argument, we'll call it the number a. So this says that this number, the integral that we're interested in, which is a number, again, it's the definite integral. So that number is between negative a and a. So we've got our number line here. We've got negative a, we've got zero, we've got a. And then we've got this number is sitting somewhere between those two, it's somewhere in this interval. So what does that mean? Well, it means that its distance, wherever that number sits, its distance to zero is smaller than a. And remember, the distance of a number to zero is just its absolute value. So this says that the distance of this number, namely its absolute value, has to be smaller than a. It's got to be closer to zero than a. So this is less than or equal to a, but that's that integral. And that's what we want it to show. Okay, so that's just how we can use the comparison properties of the functions and, and how integrals 
respect those inequalities to prove, to prove some theoretical result about how absolute values interact with integration. How about this next example? Show that if f is continuous on 0 to 2 pi, then the absolute value of the integral of f of x sine 2x dx is smaller than just the integral of the absolute value of f of x. In some sense, we are able to get rid of the sine function in our integrand at the cost of having an inequality here. Uh, this is a, an important uh, result which gets used in uh, the analysis of Fourier series, which you'll see later on if you do physics or, or engineering or math itself. Uh, but let's just see how we can prove such a result. So we've got this first integral, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of f of x sine of 2x dx. And by part a, we know that this is less than or equal to, and I can push the absolute value signs inside. So it's less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of f of x times the absolute value of sine of 2x. That's what we get by part a. Now we can note that we know the sine of 2x in magnitude is smaller than or equal to 1. So the magnitude of f of x times sine 2x is smaller than or equal to f of x in magnitude. Oh, but there's an inequality on two functions. And I know that if I integrate both of them, then the inequality is preserved. So from this note, we get that back out to the original line of reasoning, that the integral of the magnitude of f times the magnitude of sine 2x dx is smaller than or equal to the integral of just the magnitude of f. And here we're using the fact that our original function is smaller than our new function on the interval in question, and so the integrals have to respect the same inequality. And so there's the end of the proof. So that's it for this lecture. We introduced the definite integral and um, did some more examples of computing the definite integral and then looked at some properties of the integral. In the next lecture, we're going to make this connection now, the fundamental theorem of calculus that connects integration with anti-differentiation, and we're going to see that we have much quicker ways to compute integrals using antiderivatives so that we don't always have to go back to this limit of a Riemann sum to compute integrals. All right, thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you again next time.